Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Responding to the Recent Pressures on Deforestation Free Leather Sourcing. Today's presentation will be recorded and sent out to all registered participants and also will be posted on the Hub. We will have a Q&A portion throughout the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box on the webinar doc. Now on to Nicole with Textile Exchange. Nicole? Hi, thank you, Rose. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Lambert. I'm Textile Exchange's Leather Manager. And it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you, not just on behalf of Textile Exchange today, but also uh, the Leather Working Group for this joint conference call um, relative to the recent pressures on deforestation-free leather sourcing. So um, just before we, we start and to give everyone a little extra time to connect to this call, I'll just run you through our antitrust statement. Um, so Textile Exchange uh, convenes the textile community and values diversity of views, expertise, opinions, backgrounds, and experiences. It is expected that members of this community will collaborate by sharing ideas, information, and resources of publicly available information only and avoid discussions on price, strategic plans, or other private and sensitive information. Um, we then have our disclaimer. Um, basically, the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this um, webinar uh, belong solely to the speakers. And we um, strive to maintain a, a neutral role. So, um, when it comes to, to Zoom, I think everyone is, is, is quite familiar with the, with the Zoom by now. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will be made available both on the Textile Exchange website and uh, LWGs. Um, all participants are muted. That said, we really want you to, to, to uh, be actively engaged in this uh, conference call. So please use the Q&A function that you'll find in the toolbar. Um, and ask the, the, the questions you want or, or make the comments you want. So um, I think, um, and I'm convinced uh, that everyone on this call uh, is aware of the importance of, of forests, um, that forests are vital in natural cycles that balance and regulate the earth and its atmosphere, um, and how the survival of countless species, including our own, um, are really dependent on, on forests. But just as a reminder before we start, I'd like to run you through a few facts about forests on which I hope will, you'll be able to just keep in a, a corner of your mind while we talk um, through this, this uh, conference call. First of all, forests harbor most of the Earth's terrestrial biodiversity. Um, over 2 billion people rely directly on forests for their livelihoods, food, water, and so on. Forests are the second largest storehouse of carbon on Earth after oceans. And finally, forests provide critical ecosystem services needed for agriculture. So deforestation is unfortunately still something that is occurring. Um, and agricultural expansion is identified as um, the main culprit, with cattle ranching being one of the main drivers. Um, and in the past few months, there has been a series of events um, that have increased the pressure on the urgency to work towards deforestation-free leather sourcing. There's been, just as a reminder, there's been the, the New York Times article linking deforestation in the Amazona and leather use in the automotive industry. We've had um, during the COP26 um, in Glasgow, Glasgow, sorry, this year, more than 140 world leaders uh, have pledged to end um, and reverse deforestation by 2030. We then had in November, the European Commission published a proposal for regulation on deforestation free products. Uh, not long after, Stand.Earth published its Nowhere to Hide report and um, Slow Factory launched its um, call to action um, demanding brands eliminate a deforestation in their leather supply chains. Based on uh, Standard Earth's report, The Guardian published uh, this article, um, calling out a couple of brands and linking them to, to potential sourcing um, 
linked to deforestation. Um, so November was a busy month. Um, then in, in December, we had um, this article that was published in Vogue. And just yesterday, we had The Guardian publish this article on linking um, beef production in Queensland, in, in Australia, uh, and deforestation. So there is a link between leather and deforestation, and that connection is going to be made uh, until the day the problem is solved, really. Um, brands are in a particularly vulnerable position when it comes to this. Today, there is a limited visibility in the bovine leather supply chain, making it really complicated for brands to identify all the levels of farming um, in their supply chain. And so if you don't have, if you don't know what is happening all the way down to the, the cow calf farm supplying your leather supply chains, you are at risk of being linked to deforestation. So at Textile Exchange, we really see this as an opportunity to respond to this challenge. And we want to be there to, to really support you um, in making the systemic changes that are needed to stop deforestation, which is ultimately one of the most critical responses to climate change and, and biodiversity loss. So the objective of today's call is um, to give everyone an understanding of, uh, of some of the recent pressures and also discuss what are the responses the industry can make to make the systemic changes that are needed to, to stop deforestation. So our agenda will start with LWG's overview of the EU regulation proposal on deforestation free products, highlighting what we know and what we don't know yet. Um, and we'll then run you through uh, the main findings of the Stand the Earth report and give you an introduction to the Slow Flex Factory's call to action. And then uh, we'll have a discussion around the opportunities to, to respond and act. Um, after each presentation, we will open the floor uh, for questions and comments. And we're very fortunate to have um, quite a large number of experts on this call with us today. Uh, and I'll be presenting them to you very shortly. Uh, but they will be able to answer your questions and provide uh, their expert, expert um, perspective on the situation. So our speakers today from the Leather Working Group, we have Vanessa Brain, Traceability Manager, and Christina Trapman, Program Manager, and they'll have the opportunity to introduce themselves a little more later on. Um, and then on the Textile Exchange um, end, we have Anne Gillespie, uh, our Impact Acceleration Director, and myself. As I mentioned, we have um, really a, a great panel of experts with us today, and I'll just introduce them very briefly. We have Deborah Taylor, who is the Managing Director of uh, the Sustainable Leather Foundation, Hannah Deans uh, from Textile Exchange, who, who works um, with our Climate Plus strategy, um, Gustavo Gonzalez, um, who is the Secretary General of Cotans. Josefina Aisel, who works both for GRSB and Textile Exchange, and she is the director for Latin America uh, for GRSB and works with uh, the, farm, the farms in, in our impact incentives uh, program. Karen Steer, uh, who works for the Accountability Framework Initiative. We have uh, Kerry Senya, director of uh, the Leather UK. Kim Senna, who is the sustainability manager of JBS. Luca Boltri, Vice Director of UNIC, uh, Mauricio Bauer, Senior Director uh, of the Beef and Leather Supply Chains for uh, WWF, Sabrina Frontini, uh, Director of ICEC, uh, Simon Hall, Director of Tropical Forest and Agriculture um, at, uh, the, um, at NWF, and finally, Steve Softman, President of Leather and Hide Council of America. So without any further ado, um, I will hand uh, the floor to Vanessa to talk you through the EU regulation proposal. That's great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so yeah, it's a real pleasure to be able to be here today to be co-hosting this session along with Textile Exchange on such an important issue for the leather industry. So I'd first like to take us through an overview of the background of the proposed regulation for deforestation free product products that's recently been released by the EU and touch also on some other potential upcoming regulations from other countries. We'll then hear from some of our experts what their reactions are and um, you know, a bit about the implications of these proposed regulations for the sector um, as a whole. Let's go to the next slide. 
So the context for the proposed EU, EU regulations is that this is part of both the Europeans Green Deal and the 2030 EU biodiversity strategy from the European Commission. And it's from this that they've proposed this new regulation to be part of, um, to curb EU driven deforestation and forest degradation. These proposed new rules are looking to be able to guarantee that products sold into the EU do not contribute to global deforestation. And the key driver for this being bringing to for this regulation being to the identification of agricultural expansion and associated deforestation and its links to both climate change and biodiversity loss. The proposed regulation sets rules for operators producing products for the EU linked to key commodities, which have been set out as soy, beef, palm oil, wood, cocoa and coffee. But within the scope, there's also been specified that it would include derived products, including leather, chocolate and furniture. The approach that's been defined in the EU proposal is that a country benchmarking system will categorise countries according to the deforestation patterns linked to those specific in scope commodities. There'll be three categories of, of risk from low, standard and high, with associated due diligence requirements depending upon the risk category that the country of origin for the in original commodity falls into. Obligations for operators and member state authorities will vary according to the level of risk of the country of production with simplified due diligence requirements for low risk origins and enhanced scrutiny for high risk countries. The proposed regulations set out to address all forms of deforestation, so including both illegal and legal, with defined cutoff dates um, specified within the proposed regulation of the 31st of December 2020. So if we just go to the next slide, that's great. So what will these due diligence requirements entail? Um, companies will be required to complete and sign a due diligence statement in advance of placing products onto the EU market with this statement requiring the following steps to have been taken. The first will be to provide access to data on the relevant commodity type, the quantity, the supplier, country of production, and the geo coordinates for the plots of land where commodities they plan to place on the EU market were produced. The second step will require companies to use this geo data to analyze and evaluate the level of risk of associated deforestation within their supply chain. Then the third step being that companies must take adequate and proportionate mitigation me measures in respect of the risks that they have, may have identified. So what are the implications for the leather sector and what do we know about the timelines for the potential implementation of these regulations? The first thing to highlight is that the scope of which um, products and materials these proposed regulations apply to. And currently this is proposed to um, be um, in scope for raw, part processed and finished leather. So it crucially not finished products, which means the obligations of this proposed regulation will apply only to businesses importing those raw, part processed or finished leather. It is important to point out though, that it's not impossible for the scope of that to be extended during the legislative process between the three parts of the EU. Um, however, given the stage that this uh, proposal is at, and the potential implications of, of broadening that scope, it is deemed that that's unlikely, but it's important to point out that it's not impossible. From what we understand, the proposal has wide support, support across the EU and it is expected to pass and to be adopted. However, what's not currently clear is um, the timelines and they're yet to be announced from the EU. Um, but from consultations that we've had, it's expected that that process to ratify this regulation would take, we, it's estimated between one to two years for that process to happen. Following the approval process, there has been set out a clear adoption period of um, one year for larger businesses and then a two year adoption period for SMEs. In terms of how the proposed regulation will be enforced and what the potential penalties would be for non-compliance, these have been set out as the responsibility of individual member states. 
there'll be examination of the due diligence statements and the systems set up by operators for record keeping, risk assessment and mitica mitigation procedures with the provision set that there may be on the ground um, examination, there might be spot checks, field audits, um, actually in the origin uh, country of where the commodities have come from, as well as the potential for both technical and um, scientific testing, such as, as isotope, if that's appropriate for, for the commodity to determine. As well as, um, use of satellite observation data, determining whether those products are in fact deforestation free or not. Um, the penalties for non-compliance have been listed as potential fines. These could be up to 4% of the turnover of a, of a business. Um, also with the option for the EU to confiscate relevant um, products or to, um, to take the revenue that's been gained through the transaction of those specific products. So then hot on the heels of um, the announcement from the EU, the um, UK have taken the next step with their associated regulation. Um, the UK are still considering what their options are for introducing mandatory due diligence requirements um, on companies for using what they're stating as forest risk commodities. So um, this is at the stage of a second round of consultation um, to, cons to consult on the structure for these regulations, um, having just been launched on the 3rd of December. The current proposal is also for businesses that will have to undertake due diligence measures and assess um, and mitigate then any identified risks. The commodities being consulted on are similar, but not exactly the same as the EU um, in being covering cattle. So beef and leather has been noted, um, cocoa, coffee, maize, palm oil, rubber and soy. It's proposed that there be an annual reporting requirement, um, such as potentially what's set up already for the Modern Slavery Act in the UK. The penalties for non-compliance will be potentially fines and other civil actions. And the proposed scope that this consultation refers to is currently only illegal deforestation, and there are no cutoff dates that are currently referenced within the consultation document. So at this, at this stage, the scope of businesses um, that the regulation might affect isn't completely clear. Um, so whether that will apply to materials only as the current scope of the EU regulations or whether it will actually um, extend to finished products and goods isn't, um, isn't fully clear. But I think that's an element that um, you know, can be commented on and um, you know, should, be, should be given in feedback as part of the, the consultation process. So the specifics of what the consultation is seeking the feedback on um, are as follows. They're looking to get guidance on which of the seven listed commodities should be in scope for the law and um, crucially what the associated sequencing and pace of inclusion of these commodities should be. So within the consultation, they do list out three possible options of how the law could be adopted with the proposal of either initially launching with only two commodities being in scope and not defining which those two commodities would be as yet. Um, so the authorities would estimate Estimate that that would take um, an 18 month to two year period for that to be rolled out and come into effect. The second option is to have three to four commodities and they estimate that that would take a three to four year period to come into effect with the last option being to have five to seven of the commodities and that estimated to take a four to five year effect. With all of those options, there is the suggestion that there would be a six month period allowed for businesses to prepare for the regulation once it's actually been finalised. Then um, the other aspects for the consultation is looking at differing thresholds um, of scale of turnover per commodities that these regulations would apply to. So the levels that are being suggested are either um, 50, 100 or 200 million um, pounds of turnover specific to that commodity being suggested as the thresholds. Um, then the consultation also covers what businesses will be required to do in terms of risk assessment and mitigation and how this will be reported. 
then how the regulation will be enforced with the suggestion that any potential financial penalty would be capped to um, a potential maximum of £250,000 um, as a fine, again, being the suggestion in the, in the consultation. Um, so the consultation documents are on DEFRA's website. The um, consultation period runs until the 11th of March of next year. So we would um, you know, very much encourage everybody to um, be, to be participating in that consultation process. So the last region which has um, a potential new law is also the US. There is a bill under consideration by the US Senate, which is the Forest Act, um, which stands for Fostering Overseas Rules of Law and Environmentally Sound Trained. This was announced in June with a similar objective to both the EU and the UK, um, with the proposal to regulate the production of goods linked to deforestation, with a push for increased transparency of origin of materials, with a focus on cattle, soy, palm oil and wood based products. And from what we understand, there is, is fairly slow momentum behind this bill, but nevertheless, it, it is um, in the, the, the public domain. So the regulatory landscape is, is really very active on this, this topic. So um, you know, we're keen to get comment and, and reaction from our expert panel. So I'd, I'd first like to pose a question to Gustavo of, of COTANS. Um, so Gustavo, we'd be um, keen to understand your views on the EU proposal and specifically if you could comment about what level of consultation there's been with the leather industry. Well, thank you very much uh, for this presentation. It was very comprehensive and very, very well um, introduced. Um, we um, have not been consulted at all, so that's to start with. But uh, um, I asked for for the Commission to provide uh, the information. Who has been in contact uh, with uh, the Commissioner? Um, the one hand, on one hand, the uh, the Executive Vice President, Mr. Timmermans, who is responsible for the Green Deal and uh, the environment uh, the, the commissioner for environment oceans and fisheries uh, mr sinke vicius um, and i've come uh, across uh, about 10 letters that have been sent by uh, a group of uh, ngos that have been pushing for a uh, letter being included into the scope of the of the regulation so we have not been uh, consulted at all not informed, not consulted at all, because in principle, at the beginning, it was a regulation that was looking at the, the review of the timber regulation in, in the European Union. And uh, we have been uh, faced with a, a regulation that uh, with that is uh, including leather into the scope, whereby uh, leather is uh, the result of the transformation of a byproduct of the of the of the meat sector, uh, and uh, where we have absolutely no influence on uh, um, the the, the livestock or slaughter rate uh, in the in these countries. And, and Gustavo, could I just ask you what steps you're taking from um, you know, the industry perspective and the, the associations? What's your response? Well, we what we always do, uh, we bring to the Commission uh, the information on facts and figures of the industry, and we try to 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 make them understand that it is uh, in this case. Uh, uh, discriminatory and uh, disproportionate measure that uh, uh, is actually only going to increase the paperwork for the largest companies in the sector, but also make it quite difficult for the smaller industries, from, from smaller companies in, in the leather industry actually to comply. Um, it's, uh, it's really worthwhile understanding that um, the, um, the, the, the Requirements that uh, that are being put on the on the industry uh, do, um, are, are are made only because of a small fraction of raw materials that are actually with uh, deforestation risk, and we have been trying to find out whether anybody can tell us what is actually the share of uh, uh, deforestation risk commodities that are in the total amount of. Uh, raw materials that the sector imports, and we have never been given any response to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for that, Gustavo. W would um, would anybody else like like to make a comment? I mean, I don't know on that last point whether Simon or Mauricio, you might you might be able to comment on that point. Uh, 
no, I have nothing to add at this stage. Maybe on a Q&A session after. Sure. Okay, thanks, Monsieur. Um, we do have a couple of questions that's, that, that have come in. Um, the first one is to query about viscose and whether that falls outside the scope of derived wood products in the currently proposed regulation. Um, it's my understanding from, from what we've um, seen of the proposed regulation that that isn't in scope um, uh, currently, but, but again, it's... Um, a, you know, it is, it, there is still potential for that scope to, to change, but um, in its current form, I'm, I'm not aware that that's, that's included. Um, there's another question. Do our experts have any idea if these due diligence requirements will be new for most companies or are companies already doing due diligence? Um, I think, I mean, I, from, from my knowledge, in terms of uh, mandatory due diligence, any company importing um, products derived from wood would cut, fall under the scope of the e current EUTR, um, which is the European Union Timber Regulation, and there's an equivalent act in, in the UK, um, but this EU regulation will replace that, um, so you know, I think that's where the mandatory due diligence is, is already happening. Um, there's another question. Um, can someone advise who would be responsible under this regulation for leather? Would it be the clothing retailer or their supplier or tannery? Just considering that the current proposal does not include finished product, so it doesn't seem clear. Yeah, it's, it's a good point to, to clarify. Um, so under the current um, scope, as we understand it, um, it would be the um, leather manufacturers. So anybody importing um, either part processed raw material or finished leather um, into the EU. Um, but you know, as, as pointed out in, in the overview, there is potential that that could change. Um, but we, we feel that that we, we would hope is, is unlikely, but it's not impossible. Um, but yeah, as it currently stands, it's, it's the manufacturers. Um, does the, for the EU regulation that includes geolocation of the farm, is this the final processing farm or is the intent to also include birthing and raising farms? I think that is a really, really good question. Um, in terms of the, the scope of what the due diligence statement um, requires um, stating that it is the um, the supplier and the country of production is is listed. Um, I think this is definitely an area that has to that has to be clarified. Um, you know the extent to which um, that visibility and transparency is going to be required within the supply chain, um, and also an understanding of what's actually feasible and possible um, and obviously we will we will be talking about that more within this call but I think Gustavo have you got a, a comment on that point? Yes uh, yes I just uh, want to say that it is also very interesting to, to see that uh, the commission is now um, the European commission is proposing to impose on on a number of operators in the, in our sector in the leather industry uh, obligations that uh, um, uh, we are not uh, able to comply with. Uh, I, I would just like to, to indicate that even in the European Union, the, European, the, the tenants have not the possibility to trace back to the animal or to the farm uh, the, the raw materials that they have. That is uh, as a result of the uh, decisions that the Commission has taken with regard to the animal byproduct regulation and uh, the traceability system. What is possible for meat is not possible for byproducts, and heights and skins are a byproduct regulated under the animal byproducts regulation and we don't have we only have access to the immediate precedent step in the supply chain not further that means either the trader of the heightened skins or the abattoir but not to the farm so that's and that these uh, same regulations these same limitations apply also when you import raw materials from uh, outside of the european union so uh, I wonder how the uh, European tenors uh, are going to be able to comply. What is the, the thinking of the European Commission uh, of uh, putting on a burden on some operators, knowing that uh, it is impossible to comply with? Would um, anyone like to, to comment from the panel and, and respond to that? Simon, go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to be here. Yeah, I'll share my perspective. I think there's a lot of really important questions that we have to, to ask ourselves in terms of feasibility and viability, but it's important not to be stuck in this trap of thinking, you know, what was possible yesterday, what's possible today. We have to think about what's possible tomorrow and, and, and how we're going to move forward in this. There's obvious challenges with the leather sector, but let me just put some context and there will be these, these challenges are not necessarily unique. If traceability within soy meal for chicken and, and pork, you know, production is going to be uh, required to be traced. If, if, you know, cocoa and chocolate, you know, is going to be if palm oil. These are products that have far greater traceability challenges outside of a, of a physical uh, hide of leather, which is what this, this scope is. So the, I just want to recognize there's challenges in a lot of different commodity sectors. Um, there's actually quite a bit of advantages I think the leather sector has um, compared to palm oil, soy meal, cocoa sort of powder, and other types of derivative products. Um, so it's important to sort of have this sort of holistic view on sort of the scope of this. And there will be sort of challenges in terms of, I think, um, but this also isn't going to like turn on like a light switch. There's going to be, there's the, it's not even a law. There's gonna be several years while this is negotiated and, and the sort of all the details are ironed out. And then following that, there's going to sort of be a phase in period from my understanding. And so I think we have to sort of be very forward looking and sort of be you know, progressive in how we go about tackling these challenges and not be trapped with the tools that existed yesterday and limit the potential of what we can achieve tomorrow. Thanks. Great, thanks Simon. Mauricio, do you want to make a point? Yeah, in our perspective, um, I mean, I, I agree with, with Simon's position and, and obviously there are challenges and from what we have seen, this is not intended to be a turnkey. It's not something that expected to take place tomorrow. And uh, the sector will have time to adapt. Um, we agree that leather is not a cost. Uh, a, a causing deforestation is a consequence of, of the beef production, is a consequence of cattle ranching. That doesn't mean leather stakeholders are not part of the problem. They are. Um, they might not be causing the problem, but they are involved in this. If they have materials contaminated with deforestation in their supply chains, and this is what the EU regulation is, is uh, stating now, um, they're part of the problem and they can be part of the solution. That's, that's our point. And being part of the solution and it's, it's being part of these discussions that are taking place is being part of the, as Simon said, this is, this is a process that will take place and it's important to be uh, involved in, in, this, in these conversations. And I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Monsieur. Gustavo, did you have a, a point you wanted to make? Yes, yes, just to say, well, I, I appreciate that uh, the perspective from which uh, uh, Mauricio uh, and, uh, and others may be talking is different from the one that uh, uh, of the leather industry. Of course, we, we, we do not uh, deny the, the link that exists between, between uh, lead, uh, heights uh, and, and skins and the leather industry. Of course, uh, we are part of the same value chain, but uh, um, the, 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 we are not part of the problem. We want to be part of the solution. That's that's the right way to, to put it. Thank you. Great. Deborah, would you like to make a comment? Hi, yeah. I just wanted to add a little bit more to, to, to this conversation because uh, one of the questions was, are there people already in the industry that are doing something about this with outside of being forced to through regulation? And there are. There are companies that I'm talking to all the time that actually want to make changes and want to see their own responsibility levels taken further so that they can prove that they're not contributing to deforestation in any way, shape or form, directly or indirectly. And I think that even if you've got that slight distinction between direct and indirect, direct uh, responsibility, there is still a responsibility level there. Um, I think some of the work that, that we've been doing within the UNEC project over the last two years is to try to find real solutions that work interoperably, that work at, at, at more than one level, because there's no point in just 
finding solutions that only work with the top tier of the industry. We have to work across and consider the, the lower end of, of the spectrum as well. So there are things that are happening. There are people that are talking and there is a will and a desire, I think, as Gustavo just mentioned then, to find real solutions and not to be part of the problem. But for as long as we distance ourselves, we're storing up trouble for ourselves in the long term because it doesn't matter whether it is direct or indirect. Through the cattle raising, if that stops, then we're creating potential problems in those risk areas for social economies, for other elements and knock on effects. And, and if the farming is stopped there, then we lose that leather production. And then we have a problem for lots of other knock on uh, industries to that, to that. So we have to think more holistically. We have to think about the bigger picture and not just keep our heads buried in the sand and hope that it'll go away. And we've seen more and more people are moving away from leather. In fact, I had somebody that, that got in touch with me who wanted to prove traceability to prove that they were not sourcing from Brazil anymore. They used to, they're pulling out of Brazil. We want to change that. We want people to still source from Brazil, but be able to prove that they are not sourcing from those deforestation areas. We don't want people to pull out of Brazil because that's counterproductive on many levels. So I just thought it was worth adding that, but there are people that are working on systems. There are people that are working on that due diligence ahead of this regulation. But now's the time, you know, we've got a two or a three year window to find something that works for the whole industry. And I think we shouldn't close our eyes to that. We should really grab, grab it and, and take it and use this opportunity to be ready. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Deborah. I think, Josefina, do you have a, a point you wanted to make? Yes. Well, as you know, I work also for the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, and I think that also has a very strong relation with beef. And first, just to add on what Deborah said, it's just as long as beef demand still uh, continues, the leather, like in this region, I have been sharing this, but all the leather that is, the, the cow, they still have the leather, so they're just throwing that away into the, into the, into like the, in the soil or burning leather. So just moving away from leather, I don't think is a solution. I think the solution is to really try to work with all the different stakeholders to really have a better traceability system because it doesn't mean that all beef or leather producers are really doing things wrong. There is still a lot of things that are being done right. So that's very important. I think we, like, I'm, I'm from Argentina, so I think what we need to be is more transparent to have better traceability on the on the supply chain. So I think also that's something that we need to that need in, need investment to work together with governments and try to find better traceability solutions and just to really understand where is the problem and try to work together with those farmers that are really deforesting for different reasons. And then to add to that also, this is causing a lot of noise in all these countries like Brazil, Argentina, Paraguay, all the countries where I work for. And people are really defending their national forest codes. This kind of regulation is going like above the national forest codes and all the farmers and all the governments, they really feel that they have really strong forest codes. Maybe there's their need for more traceability to really connect the environmental with the health traceability, but a lot of people they really want to defend their own forest codes and this regulation is going above not really taking into account the efforts that this country has made so but it's still, they're still working already on solutions to improve the traceability of their own forest codes and then of course trying to always look for better solutions great Th thanks for that Josefina there is there is a question that's connected I mean you might have answered it in part but I'm just going to read it out um a, a query about what role the Brazilian government's playing in in regulation and reducing illegal cattle ranching um and it's in reference to specifically the Amazon biome but I just wonder whether you could comment any more on that yes all the governments are working on that I I, I, I do think they still can they can still do more so this is kind of a good way to really cause reaction from the governments the, the the sector will also put pressure to the government to really do more than what they're doing they have the forest codes but they are not monitoring they are not doing really the real enforcement of those so that's something that 
the governments could really start working on. But I think that theirs is where the need for investment is needed. And also always respect the forest codes. That's what all the kind of producers and the all the industry keeps defending here. And this is and this go above. So yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Josefina. Vanessa, uh, Vanessa, I might just let you um, close up on this one, and, and so we can. Yes, on to yeah. The rest. I was just going to say, um, I'm conscious of time now, and um, just to, to say that the questions coming on the, in on the Q and A, keep them coming, and um, ones that we've not had chance to reply to. Um, if we don't reply directly in the chat, we will make sure that we um, we get back to people um, to answer all the questions. I think, Mauricio, did you have another comment to make? Yeah, just one last comment on the uh, the question of uh, being a coal product, byproduct, or waste product. Um, I think this is uh, we respect each sector uh, position on that. Definitely, leather is a consequence of the cattle ranching, and that's I think we all agree with that. And I'm also happy to hear from Gustavo that although they don't understand themselves as being part of the problem. They're happy to be part of the solution. This is very positive. Thank you, Gustavo. That's great. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you all the experts for that um, really engaging uh, conversation. Um, so I'll uh, hand it over to, to Anne to give a, a quick overview of the Sun.Earth report and um, Slow Factory's call to action. Thank you, Nicole, and thanks uh, everyone who participated. That was such an amazing discussion. And at the end of this, we do have a good chunk of time uh, that we can discuss everything all at once and we possibly can address some of these regulation issues. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spend a few minutes um, informing you about what is in the stand.earth report. I'm sure most of you would have read that, but I just want to be sure that we're kind of creating some a common ground of understanding of what's being called out through this report. And uh, to also let you know that we're gonna facilitate a webinar directly with Standout Earth presenting on the report so that we can have a much deeper level of engagement. You can ask them about the methodologies, the, um, the thinking behind this and what they're looking for. But I, I am not in any way representing this report. I'm just giving this as a, an update. So um, I wanted to pull out a few of the slides. They presented in a slide deck, which was extremely helpful. Um, and one point I wanna pull out right away is that if you represent a company that appears in that database of, of, that they've put together, and if you believe that you're not sourcing Amazonian leather, then please contact them. Um, you know, they're very open to that. We've had one discussion with them already and uh, they're super open to hearing from people. So don't, don't be shy on that front. Uh, next slide. So I pulled out a few of the key facts and figures and, and uh, graphs and charts that they've presented in this report. And they really drive home some of the messaging that we actually brought forth at our roundtable um, summit in Dublin last month with Mauricio and Simon, we're presenting a lot of this. And this is a WRI um, report, reasonably recent, but you know, regardless of that, it just shows that cattle is a very strong driver for forest loss. And to the point of you know, whether we're involved as a byproduct, a co-product, et cetera, it is an important area to address if we want to mitigate climate change. Next slide. And of course, the key areas, the, the highest risk areas are in Central and Latin America, a little bit over in Asia. And also as, was, um, as Nicole pointed out in that most recent uh, Guardian article, there is a little bit in Australia as well. Cattle are raised all around the world, but when we look at where the highest risk areas are, it's definitely in kind of the, the southern half of uh, the North, uh, Southern America and Latin America. Next slide. So this num these numbers really stood out for me pretty hard. Uh, the deforestation caused by cattle ranching in the Amazon rainforest accounts for almost 2% of CO2 emissions annually. Uh, I wonder if this emissions from all airplane flights globally references uh, airplane flights pre or post COVID, but either way, it's a pretty big number. Next slide. 
I, I put this slide in just to kind of give a, a sense of the amount of research and, you know, whatever, whether you like or dislike this report, it is so impressive by the amount of work they have put in. Uh, these guys come with a, a kind of a deep background in doing this kind of work with other commodities uh, or commodities and in, in other industries. And they have certainly analyzed uh, an enormous amount of data from very reputable websites so um, or references. So next slide. This to me is quite important. Um, a lot of companies are considering that they are deforestation free, maybe because they're sourcing from China or Italy or their phone sourcing from any country outside of Brazil. But the fact is, Brazil does export a lot of wet leather, either in the wet blue all the way to the finished stage to these different countries where additional processing will happen. So it is important that you really can track your supply chain all the way back to the slaughterhouse or meat packer before you know that you're not sourcing from Brazil. Next slide. This is probably the crux of the report and the uh, this really complicated schematic in that shows at the bottom is one that is very live. So if you go into the website and you can start hovering over this diagram, it'll pull out all of the connections and gives the sources of the data used to create those connections. Um, but I think the number is even greater than this now, but the, here it says over 400 individual supply chain connections between various companies back to uh, Brazil, basically, and high risk areas in Brazil. And I think even the number of brands is, is much greater than 100 by now. But if you click again, but it's important to note that each individual connection is not absolute proof that any one brand uses deforestation leather. It just says that you are at a high risk of being connected to leather that is um, deriving from cattle ranches in the Amazon rainforest. So next slide. The other point that really stood out for me was the data suggesting that a good portion of the um, brands, 30%, are breaching their own policies against sourcing leather from deforestation. And in the report, they actually list out uh, the companies and the policies, whether they have a policy or not. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, this speaks to the fact that it's not enough to just have a policy. Policies are important but they're only important when they're backed up by an action plan. And I'm certainly not saying that those with policies don't have action plans. It's just calling out what they've said in this report. Uh, next one. So the, yeah, so Standout Earth really has produced the report and Slow Factory is a separate organization um, who's taken that report and really kind of pulled it into a call for action. And the, the description of the letter, letter here is that they demand that fashion brands and manufacturers eliminate deforestation by fixing systemic flaws in their supply chains. And I actually like that wording there because it's not about just stopping deforestation, it's recognizing that the system, to Gustavo's point, is not yet able to deliver the traceability needed to be fully deforestation free. However, go to the next slide, you'll see that um, the, this letter here, when you read it out in its entirety, is um, you know, acknowledging that the current assurance doesn't give that traceability, and then it is urging the fashion industry to suspend contacts with any and all suppliers that cannot provide full traceability through the entire cat, cattle life cycle. So that would be from you know, going backwards from the slaughterhouse to the finishing farm to the raising farm to the cow-calf farm. And you know that's going to be a very difficult ask. And then the second one links to the first part of this whole uh, discussion, which is to support the passage and robust enforcement of due diligence legislation in the EU, US, and UK. So uh, 
probably the more relevant uh, discussion for textile exchange to be leading. And certainly in conjunction with LWG and a lot of the experts on this call is, you know, what is our opportunity to respond and act? So the first question to look at is, you know, does leather even matter? And, you know, there are certainly a, a, a range of opinions here, but some things that we know for sure. If we start at the beginning of the beef supply chain or the cattle supply chain, because it really, it, at the beginning, it's, it's a cattle supply chain. It's not even a beef supply chain. Um, and this is a cow-calf farm where, you know, calves are being born and, and until the point of weaning, then they will pass on to a raising farm if they're not in an integrated farming system. And at that point, the producer is raising the animals to sell an animal. They, there's no, there's not even a value for the meat at this point, and there's certainly no value for the hide. Then you get to the raising farm where the animals are kind of brought up to maturity. And this is where, you know, they can spend, uh, you know, 12 to 16 months even of their life grazing on the land. Definitely uh, a higher risk of deforestation um, linkages here and a fairly invisible part of the supply chain. And again, this is one where the animals at this point are being raised to bring them up to weight for the beef. And the value of the hides to this producer is essentially zero. Then you get to the finishing farm. It could be a feedlot, it could be an intensive farming system, but this is the one that the slaughterhouse buys directly from. And again, the producer is being paid either, uh, in some cases it can be in the live animal weight and some it's the carcass weight, but Either way, they are not being paid for the hide itself. So all levels of direct and indirect farming are, are somewhat un, untouched by the economic value of the hides or the skins. At the slaughterhouse level, that's where the value can be up to 3%. And we've got some data that uh, will come out a bit later uh, or that we'll come back to in a bit, but uh, it can also be zero. And Simon actually gave me this image right here, which is from Brazil. I can't even translate it for you, but some of you may be able to know what it says. Um, but, you know, it is a fact that not all of the hides and skins that are used are going into the leather processing. Some of them are being dumped. So the, the value at the slaughterhouse level is zero to 3%. So next slide. The question I'd posed before is, does leather even matter? Well, this is the slide to say it actually does. And I've put this together years ago uh, when doing a presentation at a GRSB event. And I really love how we're interconnected with the beef industry. So at the bottom of the slide, you're seeing the three levels of farming, the cow-calf farms, the raising farms, and the finishing all the way up to slaughterhouse. That is where we share the supply chain. But on the left-hand side, you've got the meat industry, basically retails, you know, supermarkets and so on, and then the restaurants. They work through the meat processors to the slaughterhouse, and they really have a huge voice with the meat, the, the cattle part of the supply chain, because they're such a direct, a huge player in the value, and they've got very close connections. But we, in the leather industry, have very tiny connections but if you look at the blue arrows, we have a very big voice and, and presence with the computers, with the consumers. And I'm saying we as the uh, textile industry right now. Um, and whereas the meat processors don't, or the meat industries don't, uh, ask your 10 year old kid to name 10 meat brands outside of McDonald's, they probably can't do much more than that ask them to name a hundred leather or textile brands or automotive brands, and they'll talk your head off. I'm pretty sure of that. So we have an opportunity to influence and we have an even bigger opportunity by working with the beef industry to drive change. So next slide. The other thing I wanna talk about is walking away. And that's, um, it's the strategy that some brands are taking. They are, taking steps to be sure that they are not buying any leather from the Amazon or not buying any leather from Brazil or even from South America. It is a way to mitigate risk. 
Um, it's also what a lot of these, uh, some, some of the campaigners are actually pushing for, for brands to just stop buying from the Amazon completely. But, and if you go to the next slide, we need to figure out, does that actually work? And this is where we want to take a moment and ask you if you could quickly go onto mentimeter.com and type in the code and just share your thoughts on what are some of the pros and cons of the strategy to just simply stop sourcing leather from Brazil. So I'll give you a moment. And I'll give you a moment. And you can also just use the QR code then only with your phone if you, mm. you, you can have access directly to the voting. You might want to go to the responses, yep. Cons, illegal leather trade point anyone else gonna ah there you go it won't stop deforestation livelihoods are affected doesn't actually solve the problem loss of influence does not solve the deforestation issues smallholder impacts Stopping sourcing would create worse situation in Brazil, environmental damage from more dumped or burned hides, social impact, uh, hurt Brazilian farmers and economy, eliminates influence. If the tannery is global and you buy non-Brazil leather, you're still guilty by association. Uh, won't stop deforestation, will limit leverage to, to drive positive change. Some will always use the cheapest option. Uh, moving the problem elsewhere, avoiding the risks, but doesn't solve the problem. There's the political situation in Brazil, easier for brands to manage internally. That's a good point. There's no gray area. It won't drive change. We need to hold poor practices accountable. Leather will be diverted to landfill. Cattle production will not decrease. Value is in beef, which is increasingly is used in Brazil and countries that do not care about deforestation. Okay, I think we can uh, go on, Nicole. That's that's perfect. That's a fantastic input, and uh, we'll capture that and put it into the slide deck when we send this out. So I, you know, when we talked about it internally, you know, we thought, well, what are the considerations that we see from the textile exchange, exchange side? And I'm not going to answer these uh, all, but I'll be talking through some of them a bit further in the in the slide deck. But I think a lot of them being covered, you know, how much leverage does the leather market have on producers at the supply chain? That could be the answer to that may be a reason to walk away or not to walk away. Um, is there enough traceability in the system to ensure that brands, in fact, do not have Brazilian leather in their products? I've spoken to some brands who said, oh, well, we don't buy from Brazil. But when we question them further, they say, well, we don't think we buy from Brazil because there's just not yet uh, always a system where it takes a lot of investment of time and resources to really have the traceability through to ensure that that's true. I think a point that was raised a lot was, do we have a greater opportunity to engage and support producers to maintain their forests than to just walk away? And is our goal to stop cattle production or is it to just stop deforestation? And then always, you know, how do we work with the cattle industry? So I'll talk to a few of these points. Next slide. Uh, these are the statistics uh, that um, Nicole pulled together. And I think they're important to look at in the context of thinking out what is the response to, you know, these pressures to stop deforestation, to walk away, to do due diligence, etc. So a few key points. Livestock is... 10% of Brazil's GDP. It represents over half a million jobs in the meat industry, and that's an older statistic, so it's probably a bit more now. Um, Brazil has the second largest herd of cattle in the world after India. And you know that just, again, speaks to the opportunity to drive influence. There is 162, 65 million hectares of land, which is three times the size of France. So we're, you know, I think we all know we're dealing with some really substantial forests uh, that need protection. And then looking at this, the revenue of the slaughterhouses is really interesting. 
So most of their revenue is from selling the meat to the domestic market, and then the rest goes to um, the beef export, and then there's the, the kind of the other products that come out of the cow. Leather in the domestic market is, is very negligible. It's you know half of a percent. And then the leather export itself is not even 3%. So again, leather is not necessarily a huge economic driver even at the slaughterhouse level, but it is an important uh, way for us to engage. And it's not, it's not nothing, like the, the slaughterhouses still need all of these income streams of income. And then the Brazilian export of bovine leather is you know, close to $1 billion. And uh, kind of an almost an equal split in terms of volume for wet, blue, and finished, but obviously finished represents a higher value. So next slide. The other thing to look at, and one of the questions or considerations that I posed was, you know, are we trying to stop deforestation or are we trying to stop cattle production or stop deforestation? And this slide uh, that Mauricio presented uh, or put forth for our responsible leather summit really speaks to this because um, you can see that cattle production, which is the blue line on top, has been increasing steadily for the last few decades but the actual rate of deforestation has been dropping. And this speaks to the opportunity that you know, the cattle industry has to increase the productivity of the land that the cattle are already grazing on so that there's not the loss of income, there's not the loss of livelihoods. Um, they're just being much more productive on the land. And you can do that through better grazing practices, better animal management, et cetera. So that's the kind of positive, opportunity that we should be looking at and looking at how do we support that as a leather industry. Um, I'm going to pull out a few points that came out of a report that I stumbled across just a few weeks ago. I think they really speak to our opportunity to drive positive change. And within Textile Exchange, we have our Climate Plus goals, which are, it's, we have a very ambitious target to reduce the carbon footprint of fibers and materials in the textile industry by 45% by 2030. And you know, we're, we're trying to figure out in, you know, how do we do that from every single angle across every single material. And this report really pulled out the fact that land-based measures are a really good area of focus. So they land-based measures under themselves can achieve 20 to 30% of the total mitigation needed to reach that 1.5 percent target that everybody's going for. And then roughly half of cost effective, effective mitigation potential comes from the protection, restoration, and improved management of forests and other ecosystems. Next. And that forest protection that avoids deforestation and conversion of wetlands provides the highest level of mitigation potential. And then one more. And then 80% of potential for land-based mitigation is in developing and least developed countries. So I think a lot of this just keeps pointing back to Brazil and our opportunity to drive really strong change. Next. And then on a per unit area, ecosystem protection beats restoration on climate mitigation any day. So what do we do? Well, the answer is pretty clear. We all have to work together to stop deforestation. How do we do that? It's by working together, by collaborating. And it's in the spirit of that, that National Wildlife Federation, Textile Exchange, World Wildlife Fund, and the Leather Working Group have come together to put together this challenge, what we're calling the Deforestation Free Leather Challenge, where we're challenging companies to commit to source 100% of your leather from verified deforestation-free supply chains by 2030 or earlier. So next slide. I'm gonna go through this very quickly, respect to time, but uh, just to note that deforestation does include conversion. We're using the accountability framework definition and a default cutoff date of January 1st, 2020, which is in advance of the uh, December 31st one put forth by the EU commission, which means it's easily met. Uh, next slide. It does address the entire supply chain 
So all the way back to the cow calf farm, it's okay. We're not going to be asking that brands have to go back and ensure that the uh, cow calf farms, and their supply chain are identified and deforestation free. It will be working through um, expectations at the slaughterhouse level to deliver on that. Um, but what we're what we are having to do is build up the traceability because right now the system, the leather network, supply network cannot deliver traceability all the way through to that. So we've got stages and a path forward that uses the leather impact accelerator, the impact incentives to drive up that supply. Verification is going to be very critical. Um, there's going to be verification, particularly of the deforestation free status and the connections with the direct and indirect farms. NWF will help with that. And uh, a key point is that even though we're saying you know verification is not required for low risk producers, those would be the countries that will probably map over to what the EU has identified as low risk. If you do not know the countries where your leather is coming from, you can click again, Nicole, um, that is gonna be considered high risk. The next. And then the 2030 timeline, we've been challenged on that a little bit because it seems like a long time frame. Um, but you know, this, this matches up with the UN decade of action. We absolutely encourage companies to aim for something earlier and we will name and fame you if you do. But we also wanted to give a time frame that people could confidently sign onto and that we know will succeed. And the roadmap for getting there is not going to allow companies to just wait until the last minute and then, you know, act or not act. There's going to be a pathway forward that involves engaging with the supply chain right away to support farmers to protect their forests and to stop deforestation. And that's where these kind of different tools and systems that we've developed uh, will help. And yeah, it's aimed at everybody, all sectors. And next slide. Just to let you know, this is not uh, has not been officially launched. That will be happening in uh, February in 2022 in Milan. And uh, we are going to be putting together a toolkit and offering support to really help brands succeed and to, uh, to really drive that impact. Next slide. So briefly, how are we going to work together? Uh, you can click through on this one. Everything's looking at using the accountability framework definitions. WWF and NWF will help support that traceability and supply chain mapping and, and verification at the two different parts of the supply chain shown here. We have the impact incentives that can be used immediately for brands to deliver support to farmers to be deforestation free. And then the leather impact accelerator and the leather working group, who's also working on the chain of custody tools, can provide support at the processing sides. Okay. Um, just, yeah, I think I'll skip through this because I know we're tight on time. Um, but Nicole, do you want to speak a little bit to the leather re reality check report? Yeah, sure. So I'll just be really quick because uh, I really want to have time for, for, for a discussion around, around this. Um, but basically, when we first were working on, on Leather at Textile Exchange, um, we realized that the information and data um, about cattle production and leather production was quite scattered. And it was sincerely quite time consuming to, to actually gather the information we needed to have a good understanding of the realities of, of the bovine leather supply chain. Um, at Textile Exchange, we work a lot with brands and in particular with their sustainability departments. Um, and we know how overworked they are and they do not have, you know, the, the time to do that type of research. Um, but that knowledge is really critical in understanding, you know, the, the, the challenges of, of their supply chain. Um, so what we're hoping to create, sorry, is a, is a bit of a living report, which will be a holding place uh, to gather information on cattle pra uh, production practices and leather production practices, uh, which would address both what's happening on a global scale, but also dig in a bit into what's happening on a national scale in, in the, the high, highest producing countries. 
uh, <clears throat> our approach will be to lay out the facts as they are without calling out um, what could be considered as um, best practice and rather really focus on the state of play and, and you know, what are the most common and legal practices and trends. So we'll be identifying, selecting and gathering publicly available data but we also know that this will not be sufficient to, to cover all the aspects we want to, to be included in the report. And so we'll be reaching out to, to our partners in a really collaborative way to, to gather um, additional uh, knowledge and data um, they might have. So as I mentioned, this will be um, a, a living document uh, that we hope to see evolve. Um, and we're hoping to publish it um, before the summer of 2022. But we are limited in resources um, and we are hoping to contract someone to help us. Um, so we would also welcome any financial contribution to making this report uh, happen as soon as possible. So please reach out to us if you're, you're interested in helping. And so talking about reality check, I am going to hand over to the LWHD uh, team straight away to talk you through what the state of play is when it comes to traceability to the cattle farming uh, levels of the, the leather supply chain. That's great. Thanks, Nicole. I'll, I'll try and be as brief as I can, um, but I'm just going to take you through just a brief bit of background about the potential and the challenges for traceability within the leather supply chain. And that's looking through the lens of um, the farming styles and trends that the uh, global meat production sets out. So um, we have some data here that's been collected by our animal welfare group from the LWG. And the first aspect is to consider the type of livestock by region and the typical farming styles that exist globally. So this map shows the diversity of the farming systems that there are globally, and it's likely that your leather is coming from a number of these farming systems. Um, they all have their own unique challenges in terms of what can be traced and how many stages are typically involved in the lifetime of that cattle um, really varies greatly. So another key challenge that regions dictate um, is the nature of that meat production. So the difference between an industrialized production um, versus small scale um, informal meat production, which is common across um, Asia and, and, and Central Africa. Um, the map also touches on um, the, the green areas showing where the highest potential for traceability um, is, but we'll look at that in a little bit more detail just in, a, in a further slide about um, cattle. But you know, the kind of key message here really is that there is a variety of these systems globally and that really no one size is gonna fit all in terms of the approach to taking traceability forward within the, the leather supply chain. So this next slide, and if you just click again, um, I've realized Anne, that your figures actually are more recent than ours, which is actually really fascinating because this context of the global distribution of cattle and the, the kind of volume of the, of the um, cattle herds. Um, this is figures from 2019 showing Brazil as being the largest um, producer, which obviously has now switched with India. Um, so it's quite interesting to, to see that change. Um, so if we go to the next slide, that's great. So then again, based on information from our animal uh, welfare group, and if you can just click one more time, I think there's another, yeah, that's great. Um, this next map is showing us an insight into the um, theoretical levels of traceability for cattle. Um, so the right-hand side has, um, linked to the shading for particular countries and it splits that again into the two categories of the darkest green referring to regions where there's non-industrialized farming and informal slaughter so again predominantly in Asia and Central Africa and then the lighter colors showing where there is the potential for traceability right the way back to the birth farm um, more commonly in regions such as Australia, Europe um, and the US um, but a more mixed picture in in South America, um, can see through the, the graded colors. And um, it's noted here that there is, um, there is potential for, for higher traceability requirements and that's specifically linking to beef that is sold into the European markets, but it's um, a very low proportion of um, the uh, beef that's produced, only 1% of Brazilian um, beef and 2.5% of Argentinian beef going to, to Europe. So um, if we just go to the next slide. 
So I just very briefly wanted to just touch on the key things that we're doing from LWG to be driving traceability forward. And um, currently there's certified facilities in 55 countries around the world. And this represents uh, a quarter of the world's finished leather production. Um, so it really means that we've got the potential to really drive positive change um, and incremental best practice at scale. And this is what you know, we're really um, committed to doing. Next slide. So traceability is, is really a key priority for us and we're working across a number of sectors to ensure that we deliver a robust verified system for sustainable leather and um, turning and um, but to meet with our vision as well to support along with the DCF challenge of um, all leather to be deforestation and conversion free by 2030. We've got a number of projects underway. Um, one is a collaborative supply chain mapping project where we're partnering with expert NDOs and academics to map the leather supply chain. The focus initially is on South America and that's going to provide a real knowledge base to drive awareness about deforestation risks and the potential to to assess other environmental and, and social aspects of the supply chains. And the vision for that is that it's going to be a joint resource um, to uh, be able to be accessed by the industry to really inform and support brands when they're looking at conducting their due diligence uh, and looking at what actions they can take to address the, the, the challenges. Um, in terms of more broadly deforestation and due diligence, our philosophy is really to drive that incremental change and, and work in partnership with the industry and looking at the time bound targets to set um, so really developing our approach with our NGO partners and looking to achieve that goal of 2030 but you know earlier where where possible as, as Anne was saying um, then the third area which is really going to deliver transparency is our work to develop the chain of custody and um, that's going to enable verified product claims and management of certified level at a transactional level so this is about providing a mechanism to link those verified um, origin materials um, coming from farms such as those receiving impact incentives um, to really underpin those commitments that we hope many brands are going to make to the DCF challenge. So, you know, I think the most important theme running through all of this is, um, you know, really is collaboration and, um, you know, our traceability work. Um, we have our traceability working group um, that is um, really driving this forward as, and, and representing our, our, our members and wanting to enable brands to be part of the solution. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Vanessa. As always, impressive work that you guys are doing. Um, so I wanted to just start to wrap up with some of the key talking points that we want to put together. Uh, we have some elab we've elaborated on them a little bit in a document that kind of we're playing around with. Um, but one is that leather itself does not drive cattle production. However, it does provide opportunities to influence change. We feel that it is better to engage and to drive the solutions than to just drive avoid the risks. Full supply chain traceability is not yet feasible and all brands cannot deliver on deforestation free leather. Um, however, there's obviously a lot of work happening to uh, change that. But we can't wait for that traceability to happen. You know, even with all the efforts of uh, the different systems and programs and players and LWG, it's still gonna take some time and we need to take action now to stop deforestation. We need scale and speed, and this is only going to come through alignment of targets and actions and the collaboration that we're setting up right here. And that we really need a commitment from all sides, from brands, from beef and leather industries, and from the government. So next slide. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities for action. We've got the reality check report, the leather impact accelerator, and the LEA impact incentives, which feed into the deforestation free leather challenge. The Responsible Leather Roundtable will continue to give a lot of opportunities for engagement. Uh, last year, we had five webinars on traceability. I'm sure there'll be more coming. We've got the LWG Deforestation Free uh, Deforestation Steering Committee, and then also the traceability work. Um, and then, you know, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. So, um, yeah, I think after now we're ready for some discussion. And I wanted to start by Addressing, I answered a couple of the questions that came in um, by um, by typing in the answers, but a couple I want to answer live. 
One was around what do each of the impact incentives cost? Is it a standard rate per incentive or does it change by the market, similar to RSPO? Uh, the answer to that one is it is a market-based pricing mechanism. So it's based on supply and demand. And we would expect that the impact incentives that are attached to very high risk areas where there's the greatest amount of change will represent the greatest story for the brands. And in the end, it's up to the brands, you know, the, the value that the brands will get will be to demonstrate their support for farms to make these positive changes. Um, uh, there's a question about, um, yeah, Rogeria has uh, corrected me on that image. It actually was not from Brazil. I didn't know that the language was uh, Spanish, not Portuguese. Um, so he's saying that there actually is not any uh, landfill of hides in Brazil. So I stand corrected. And I did want to call out one. Um, there's a couple of comments that Simon, you had answered. Uh, the strategy and the challenge. Um, do we approach the traceability, um, the traceability one tannery by one, or does a first tannery selected as a pilot and implement more broadly? So Simon, I'll just read this out. In our view, the greatest opportunity is to support implementation of effective traceability and deforestation monitoring systems at the meat packer level, so slaughterhouse. Um, if these companies get it right, then all of the products that flow through them, the beef, the leather, the tallow, et cetera, will have positive and responsible sourcing attributes embedded already, and that will flow downstream to supply chain actors. The entire value chain has a role to play in helping realize this opportunity. And that is really speaks to the way the, the challenge is designed. We're gonna support brands to link back to those meat packers or slaughterhouses, set expectations for them to then deliver fully deforestation free uh, hides that go back, that trace it all the way back to the cow-calf farm. So I'm just going to pause for a second, see if anybody wants to raise a hand, any of our experts are raising hands. Um, and Nicole, let me know if you see any hand. Ah, yes, Sabrina. Uh, yes, thank you. I would like to add something about our work uh, on these issues because uh, Italy is doing really a lot uh, about deforestation. And since 2018, we have also a collaboration with, uh, with NWF. We have specific traceability schemes and we are working a lot also to improve the data collection and their analysis uh, to make this tool more reliable possible. And uh, in addition, uh, starting from this year, we also have a collaboration with WWF uh, which has become also our member. Uh, but we must push, in my opinion, uh, for a top-down traceability and more transparency uh, from the farm to the tannery, because now we are doing uh, a bottom-up work through certification. And for sure, it's not so simple uh, to have all the information that we need. That, uh, I'm so I'm sure that uh, we can be part of the solution, but we need uh, to work all together and not always as a competitor. So I hope uh, in uh, this uh, discussion and in your participation and collaboration to improve. Also because Italian tanning sector is really doing a lot for this. Great, yeah, perfect, thank you. Does anybody else wanna have a comment? Um, oh, yep. We have Steve. Well, Steve, yeah. Hi, Anne. Thanks. And, and thank you all for having me here. I've just been kind of lurking in the background. But one thing I would just like to highlight for everybody is it, it's come through in this discussion, but I'll, I'll just really drive it home for some, especially some of the brands on the on the call here. The leather, the leather supply chain is so incredibly different because of the byproduct nature of, of the, the raw material. It's not like what you all are probably used to dealing with on like a cotton side or some of your synthetic materials where you have a direct link back to your suppliers and you can dictate through uh, a lot of uh, uh, terms directly that can then kind of be, be incorporated fairly quickly. Within the leather industry, we are kind of constrained by uh, the mechanics of the cattle industry in which we operate. So the cattle industry is who implements traceability. 
and, and it's the cattle industry in various countries who who will need the tool to develop the tools and get the buy-in from stakeholders and, and that type of thing. Now, can the leather industry be part of that process and encourage it? Of course, absolutely, and we do definitely. But I think that you're 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 sensing some of the frustration from those of us who work on the leather side, where where comments that I've seen a couple today of why can't the leather industry just go do traceability with animals? It's like well, it's because we're constrained by by the existing systems that are in place there. So we have to work within those boundaries. So it's a complex system. There's a lot of nuance to it, and that's what makes it so challenging, frankly. But we're you know we're, we're all as, as Gustavo said, we we want to be part of the solution, obviously. And, and do you want to just briefly say who you're with, Steve? Yeah, sorry. Uh, Steve Southern, Leather and Hide Council of America, uh, the, the Hide and Leather Industry Association here in the U.S. Perfect. Thank you. Gustavo? Yes, thank you. I just want to, to, to highlight that uh, um, the, the leather industry doesn't shy away from taking action in, in, in a, this very important topic. Of course not. Uh, we, we are, as I mentioned already in, in, the, um, in the chat box I put in, there an article that we put on our on our website uh, where we started the dialogue with the with the meat sector or it back in 2019 and we reset those also 2030 as a as a as a date for for being able to trace back to the farm and to the animal the the height that we are buying so it's uh, it, it's it's quite aligned actually with the dates that you are being you you setting but we want to to work instead of a stick with our suppliers with a carrot in order to achieve the results. What, what we uh, as in the leather industry really feel is unfair and discriminatory is that, that the leather sector is being stigmatized. Um, entering into this uh, uh, EU regulation of uh, deforestation as the only byproduct that is actually singled out, there is a stigmatization. And it's not fair because it's, uh, it's making something um, we're charging some, somebody just because we are a successful recycling sector. We are recycling a byproduct from the, from the meat sector and we are very successful. We have been so successful that it, we, have, we have become a multi-billion uh, um, uh, industry uh, at global level. That is, that is because we, we, are, we are doing a good thing and we're doing it well. So it's, it's unfair that we, for that we are stigmatized and uh, we should be thinking a little bit uh, of uh, um, saying it and, and, and communicating this, uh, uh, what the good things that we're doing to the, to the general public. And I think the brands could, uh, could help us in doing that. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think it's a very good point. And I think, you know, when we look at the way the leather has been called out uh, in, in so many different ways, but, yeah, we can turn this into an opportunity uh, as a powerful way to drive positive change and, and to highlight all the great things that leather is inherently as a material and then also the way it deals with waste and, and so on. So uh, well heard. I'm going to just, Anne, I, yeah, I was just thinking just before we finish, if we could maybe just give the opportunity to, to, to Kim uh, Senna from uh, oh, JBS sorry, yes. to, to also uh, make a little comment and, and um, mm -hmm. Yeah, tell us what JBS is, is also doing on this topic. Well, thanks, Nicole. Uh, thanks, Anne, for the opportunity to be here. And uh, it's really heartwarming to, to listen to everyone and to see that uh, Anne's rhetorical question about how can we solve the problem? And it, it's through working together. It's the same message everyone is, is bringing to the table. And it's true. I mean, if we try to learn from the past, uh, that what we can do differently from now onwards is to work together. Uh, deforestation, it's a lot more complex than, than directing one problem or the other. It comes from historical reasons from decades ago, uh, colonization of the Amazon, um, social problems are now in place, low uh, HDI is a reality in the Amazon biome, land grabbing, is a major contributor to uh, deforestation, and that comes for several from several reasons. One of them being uh, low productivity, low technological support. To because, as Anne showed in one of the plots, um, cattle ranching and agriculture in Brazil don't need more land. That's it, it's just not needed. What happens happens because of uh, other reasons related to land grabbing and to low productivity, low. Uh, technological 
solutions to making uh, cattle ranching in Brazil more uh, productive in the end. And traceability, of course, plays a very important role in this because it can bring visibility, right? And the private sector for more than a dec decade now, whoever is more advanced in monitoring catchery in Brazil, uh, and we have to look at the, the monitoring and traceability from two different tiers. When you talk about direct supply, we have things very advanced so far. So uh, the system is audited. It has 100% com compliance. It, it has blocked more than 14,000 suppliers over the years. In one company, I'm talking about JBS here, but th there's, of course, some others doing uh, the same level uh, of work uh, to monitor its direct suppliers. So that, that works. The, the challenge uh, for the whole sector in Brazil is to, to tackle indirect supply. And that being getting the same level of visibility to the indirect suppliers uh, as we have to the direct suppliers. We, we as a company, we, we are leading this approach and trying to bring a solution that doesn't exist so far uh, through the transparent livestock plat farming platform. It is based on a blockchain technology. The idea is to engage, again, engage is the word of the hour. So engage with the suppliers, bring visibility to their suppliers and work together towards uh, uh, a thorough visibility of the whole supply chain. Ultimately, uh, we, we have a goal for this year, which is 1 million cattle heads monitored. And I'm pretty excited to, that I'm pretty confident that we will reach that within this platform. And for the, the future, we will have this time to uh, engage with the whole supply chain. But uh, in, from 2015 onwards, every supplier that wants to sell to JBS will have to have his supply chain monitor upstream. Um, and just to, to wrap up, again, I believe agribusiness, uh, any land use related uh, sector can play a role in solving the challenges humanity faces. It can be global warming, it can be loss of biodiversity, it can be, be uh, food insecurity for the the, the the generations to come, but uh, whichever problem it is, we by working together and by engaging and by looking at the problem and facing it and not turning their backs to it, that's how we're going to solve it. And um, again, it talks like this make me excited to see that maybe in what we didn't do in a hundred years, we'll be able to do in the next decade, as Textile Exchange puts it. So uh, thanks again for the opportunity, and I'll be here to share. Great. Nicole, do you want to wrap up? Yeah, thank you so much, Kim. I think that was a brilliant ending to, to this mm -hmm. discussion. And thank you to all the experts that made um, the time to be to be a part of this call. I mean, your contribution was, was so valuable. Um, thank you to all the participants, um, the attendees today. Um, this is going to be our last call of the year. Um, so we wish you all really happy holidays and happy new year. And we'll be back um, in January with, um, with exciting projects and, and new, uh, new calls. Um, this was definitely just the beginning of, of the conversation on this topic. So wishing you all a wonderful rest of your days or evenings and uh, we'll be uh, in touch shortly. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you to our speakers and thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a friendly reminder, an email will be sent out to all registered participants with a link to today's presentation. That concludes our webinar. Thank you. Goodbye.